Hey everyone! These days, trailers have become such an integral part of the film industry that audiences rarely show up to a premiere if they haven't seen the trailers first. Some viewers even have the superpower of being able to tell whether a movie is good or bad just by watching its trailer. As you may have suspected, however, trailers haven't always played such an important role in the film industry. There was a time when the thought of creating a short promotional film for a movie didn't even cross anyone's mind. Well, that's the exact time period we'll be discussing in this video. This is the history of trailers, where they came from, how they changed over time, and why they're even called trailers. We hope you enjoy. Oh, oh. Here I come. Oh, here I come. Oh. In a first for us, our story this time actually starts at the beginning. So let's go back to New York in 1913 and head straight for Broadway, where an advertising manager named Niles Grunland came up with an unusual way to advertise a future project as he was trying to promote a theater production called The Pleasure Seekers. He shot a short video that turned out to be nothing special, just some footage that had been taken during the actor's rehearsals of the production. What was interesting was how Grunlin chose to distribute this video. He made a deal with movie theaters who agreed to show his commercial for the Broadway production between film screenings. It's worth mentioning here here, one feature of the way movies were shown in theaters back then. As you might have guessed, multiplexes didn't exist in 1913. Each theater had just one hall, and screenings weren't divided up into scheduled showtimes like they are today. A viewer would buy a ticket and could stay in the hall for as long as they liked. Movies were shown non-stop. One would end, another would begin, and then another, and another. Once the list of films for that day's screening had ended, it started all over again. The result was viewers leaving the theater whenever they wanted. Granlin suggested that his Broadway production be advertised in between film showings. Movie theater owners liked the advertiser's creative idea, which had never occurred to them before, and they began using it themselves from then on. Granlin's advertisement was the first step in the evolution of trailers, that is, the first of many. Now, let's leave New York and head to Chicago, where, around the same time, a film industry pioneer named William Selig came across an interesting detail while reading one of the local newspapers. His attention was drawn to a work called The Adventures of Kathleen. It wasn't the novel itself that caught his attention, but the way it was presented. The Adventures of Kathleen consisted of 13 episodes, with one episode featuring in the newspaper per week. At the end of each episode, the characters would find themselves in some kind of trouble, and that's where the story would leave off. Readers were encouraged to find out how the heroes would get out of their predicament in the following week's issue. That's right, this was the first use of the cliffhanger technique that modern series creators love so much now. Selig was so impressed with this tactic that he decided to adapt The Adventures of Kathleen for the big screen. It would also consist of 13 episodes, each ending with a cliffhanger. Selig wanted to keep audiences coming back to the theater by harnessing the same energy that caused fans of the series to buy a new issue of the newspaper every week. And his plan worked. Audiences willingly returned to the theaters every week to find out what had become of their favorite characters. Thus, Granlund and Selig, despite not even knowing each other and being many kilometers, excuse me, miles away, nearly simultaneously came up with two basic principles of trailers that are still in use to this day. Namely, that a promotional video should be short and should hook the viewer so they come to the theater to find out what happens to the characters in the short video. Theater owners quickly figured out that they could combine these elements and began making the first trailers, which, by the way, were not shown to the audiences before the movie started, like we're used to, but after. In fact, it is widely believed that the origin of the term trailer comes from these short clips being shown afterwards, rolling in behind the feature film like a transportation trailer would behind a truck. A few years later, film studios began producing their own movie trailers. Not surprisingly, the earliest of them were very different from what we see today. At that time, they looked somewhat primitive and mainly consisted of bits of the film mixed in with text descriptions of what was happening on screen, plus a list of the leading actors. Studios didn't really want to spend the extra money to cut and stitch fragments of the film into a trailer which, need I remind you, required far more effort and time than it takes one of us on our smartphones today. Fortunately for film studios, there was one person who saw trailer making not just as a tedious and time-consuming process, but as a great opportunity to make money. That person's name was Herman Robbins. He offered to take over the entire process of creating trailers and other promotional materials for film studios. All the studios had to do was pay on time for the work completed. Studios eagerly agreed to this mutually beneficial deal. In 1919, in New York, Herman Robbins created a company called 
the National Screen Service, which for 40 years held an absolute monopoly on the creation of promotional materials for films. From trailers and posters to advertisements in newspapers, as the film industry changed, trailers naturally changed as well. They started to feature music, and soon narrators had replaced the text description of the on-screen action. By the hope of escape to the Americas, but they're all trapped, for there is no escape. But as I said earlier, although the NSS monopoly was long, it still came to an end. One important factor that led to the dissolution of the monopoly was that many prominent directors had begun to see trailers as another creative outlet. One of those directors was Alfred Hitchcock, whose trailer for the film Psycho consisted of a tour of the filming locations, with Hitchcock himself as the tour guide. Another director who made his own trailers was Stanley Kubrick. In his trailer for the film Dr. Strangelove, the director dynamically pieced together shots from the movie accompanied by an equally dynamic audio track. His concept was as close as possible to today's trailers. Over time, more and more directors and studios began creating their own trailers, and by the 1980s, NSS was out of business. But still, how did trailers, which were still only shown exclusively in movie theaters, become such a massive and popular phenomenon in the film industry? To find the answer to this question, we'll need to revisit the year 1975 and look at a young, aspiring director named Steven Spielberg, who was preparing to introduce his film Jaws to the world. At that time, the young Spielberg had no idea that, in addition to turning his whole life upside down, his movie about a killer shark would also give rise to something known as a blockbuster, and play a critical role in the popularization of trailers. America's movie theater industry in the 1970s worked in such a way that films would first premiere in the big cities, after which they would trickle out to the smaller towns. Jaws, however, was the first film to be released simultaneously in every American city, regardless of its size. The movie also premiered in the summer, an unprecedented move at the time. Before that, film studios wouldn't even consider the summer season when selecting release dates for their movies, as they believed that few people would want to sit in a stuffy movie theater when they could be outside in the warm weather. When Jaws was released on June 20th and made $260 million in the US alone, grossing $470 million worldwide, the studios changed their mind. Thus, Jaws became the world's first ever summer blockbuster. Its phenomenal success at the box office was due in large part to the film's successful advertising campaign, which had a budget of $700,000 a record for that time. Promotional material for the film was everywhere, and trailers weren't just shown in movie theaters, but even broadcast on television across the nation, making the trailer for Jaws the first ever trailer to be shown on TV. Obviously, this practice hasn't gone away, and has only evolved even more with the internet as an additional platform for viewing trailers. Well, as you can see from this video, it has taken over 100 years for trailers to go from short, unrelated cuts of a movie shown exclusively in theaters, to the dynamic, vibrant video that we watch on YouTube today. I did my best to fit the history of all of it into a shorter time frame, and I hope you enjoyed it. This has been the history of trailers. If you liked the video, I would appreciate it if you left a like and a comment under the video and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching. See you soon, everybody.